this is first part of a two-part statement. Uh, we will do another one. I focus on the techniques for ISPs. So the first part is more technique. The second part is the applicability, how it's applied. session will post, uh, uh, we'll upload the slide just so you get the access it. Uh, feel free to ask questions, um, just stay in the, into the mic and um, uh, you, can, you can ask questions. So on the first session, um, the DGT 101, we'll, we'll discuss first the DGT basics and then um, We'll, we'll discuss the scaling techniques and how commits are used in DGT. <coughs> in second section, in the second section, we'll focus mostly on uh, how DGT is used in ISPs, and in addition, we'll also discuss some uh, DGT security related features. <coughs> so, on the DGT basics, first, we'll discuss what a, what DGT is. Um, and then the DGT attributes, the different attributes of a DGT route, that is, and the path selection algorithm, <coughs> and uh, how different policies are applied with DGT using the DGT attributes, and we'll discuss finally the DGT capabilities. <coughs> so DGT as you all know is a routing protocol. It is used to exchange routing information between different networks. And networks here is a loose term. So in this case, consider networks to be a collection of routers and systems that are administered by a single entity. <coughs> uh, it is exchange gateway protocol. So it's between different um, networks instead of within a network. It is described in RFC 4271, and there are other, several other RFCs that deal with DGT, <coughs> but RFC 4271 is the main one. Um, 4276 provides you with an implementation report on DGT, and 4277 describes your personal experience using DGT. Both of them are good readings. I recommend you use them. <coughs> there are two IETF working groups, primarily focused on DGT. Uh, the first one is Internet Domain Routing um, Working Group. And the second one is Secure IDR. The first one deals with uh, DGT in general. The second one focuses on the security aspect of DGT. And we'll, later on, we'll discuss one aspect of that uh, protocol, um, uh, that feature that focuses on the security aspect of DGT. <coughs> Autonomous system is the basic or, or the, the, the corner of, of DGT. Autonomous system describes a single network administered by a single entity, essentially. <coughs> um, it is a number used to uniquely identify that specific um, network. Um, in general, it, it is administered by a single entity. It's, it's administered by a single entity. <coughs> it's possible that a single entity may have multiple autonomous system numbers because of uh, mergers, acquisitions, and so on. <coughs> So the system number is a collection of a collection of um, entities, routers, and networks that <coughs> that run the same internal routing uh, protocol that have the same uh, policy um, routing policy. It is a sing it, it, typically it is a single routing protocol inside that network. Uh, but it's possible in some cases to that some, some service providers use multiple routing protocols and then they use BGP to, to bind those multiple routing protocols. Particularly if your network is large, that's, um, that's possible. Um, but in general, 
the core part of the network always runs a single uh, routing protocol. But if it is a large network, a large service provider, the edge may be different routing protocols and then aggregated via BGP for internal use. <clears throat> Um, it's usually, autonomous system is usually under a single entity, but as I discussed earlier, it's possible that a single entity may have multiple autonomous system numbers because of, again, mergers, acquisitions. <clears throat> um, it is identified by a two octet number, uh, but since we are running out of that two octet number, uh, a, a four octet number is introduced, and now you can have a four octet uh, autonomous system number. And it, soon it will be very difficult to get uh, a two octet autonomous system number, uh, so you will have to use a four octet autonomous system number. <clears throat> so the four octet ASN was introduced by RFC port 893. <clears throat> so the Two octet ranges obviously from zero to 65, um, 535, which is to the power of 16 minus one. Uh, and the four octet starts from two, uh, 65, 536, up to to the power of 32, which is that number. And <clears throat> the zero and 65535 um, six, five, five, five are reserved, so they cannot be used. Uh, one through 64,495 from the two octet space is typically used for the public inter internet. And then there are a couple of blocks for documentation, and there is one block for private use. Um, and then there is one specific card that is 23456 that used to represent a, um, a four octet ASN within a two octet domain, particularly if that two octet domain or router or device doesn't understand four octet autonomous system number. And we'll, we'll discuss that later on. <clears throat> the, so the, the 32 bit range, which is a four octet range, is specified in RFC. Uh, uh, 5396, so this is for your reference, so it's good to go and refer them. Uh, it's defined as S plane. This is plane number, but it's possible to express into a dash format as well, instead of just a plane S thing. So the, the other system numbers are <coughs> distributed by uh, arrives or the registries. The registries. You can in some cases, you can also get them from upstream service providers. <clears throat> so as you can see here, uh, from the current two octet autonomous system number, um, more than 3,000 has been assigned or allocated, and more than 40,000 are visible on the internet. Some have received uh, four octet uh, autonomous system numbers, but they, their use is not yet um, large as compa when compared to the two octet uh, ASN. Uh, this is expected, you know, um, since service providers may have older routers in their network, uh, which may not be able to, to, to participate in a four octet ASN. So it will take some time for those devices to be purged from the network and eventually, you know, all the network will be able to uh, uh, to deal with four octet to support four octet for the ASN. So, as you can see, um, about eight thousand has been assigned from the four octet space, uh, and uh, only thirty-seven hundred are visible. So, over thirty-seven hundred are visible on the internet. Uh, you can see some of these numbers from those two uh, links from the, uh, uh, the official INR site as well as from the Kotaro uh, website. <clears throat> so as these, nu these numbers are changing, obviously, if you look at the number, I, 
and you're down, it will be significantly different. But those numbers are current as of today, the one that you saw. <coughs> so DG basics, so you see that in, in this particular example, there are three different networks. And assume that these three different networks are owned, operated, and administered by three different entities. And uh, you see those AS numbers, even though in this documentation we are using 100, 101, and 102, the recommendation is to use those address ranges that are explicitly specified for documentation purpose. Um, so that, you know, particularly if you are providing configuration examples, you don't want uh, people to copy paste it and uh, create problems. So that's the reason why the documentation but in this particular case, we have three different uh, networks, uh, AS100, AS101, uh, and 102. So there are peerings between uh, autonomous systems. So in this case, there is a peering between, um, you can have two, it's possible to have two peerings between 100 and 101, the, on the top side and on the bottom side. And then 100, 102 may have appearing with 100 and appearing with 101. BGP uses TCP for exchanging routes um, within a single autonomous system or between of, uh, different autonomous systems. Uh, it uses uh, TCP port 179. It is a path vector protocol, so it's somehow similar to, uh, so it's not, so, uh, as you know from the, uh, from IDIC protocols, it's usually either distance vector or uh, link state protocols. But in this case, the path vector is slightly different from distance vector. Uh, it's uh, much more robust than distance vector, but it's also scalable. So we'll, we'll see uh, what the, the path vector protocol means. It uses incremental updates so which means whenever there is a change in routing, if a route is deleted, only that route is removed. Or if a new route is added, only that, the, the added route is sent. Not a complete, uh, a complete route is not exchanged unless a new peer is established. Um, or a peer is reset. That's the only case when you exchange the full table. Uh, if uh, a route is changed, also only the updated the, only that change route is sent, uh, but there is no any full route exchange unless you are starting a new BGP station or you are resetting the BGP station, the BGP peering relationship between two devices. So there are two types of peers, internal and external BGP, and we'll discuss them um, later on. So internal is within the autonomous system and externalities between autonomous systems, and, and we'll discuss them in more detail. Uh, DMC within the context of BGP refers to the network that's, that interconnects different autonomous systems. So in this case, you can see the DMCs are the bottom one network, a LAN network, and the direct connection at the top. <clears throat> So basically, BGP receives multiple passes from different uh, autonomous systems or from different BGP speakers, essentially. If, if it has a peering relationship between uh, this router and multiple other routes, it receives all those routes, and then it compares those routes, selects the base route, and then installs the base routes into the routing table, as well as advertises the base routes into other peers and we'll see when it advertises and to which types of peers it advertises routes later on. Uh, so base pass is sent to external uh, BGP neighbors. It's also sent to internal BGP neighbors, but there are conditions where it sends to internal BGP neighbors and when it doesn't, and we'll discuss that later on. The other very important aspect of BGP is it is heavily policy influenced. So service providers have different policy tools that they can apply to influence 
the routing, uh, the routing selection decisions. And we'll discuss uh, those routing policies later on. So ABGP and IBGP refers to external BGP peering and internal BGP peering. Uh, BGP obviously is used both internally and externally, but in, in, in all of these cases, you typically it's used to carry uh, to uh, carry routes from the local network to the external networks and to receive routes from external networks. But for internal routing decision purpose, usually the IGP is used for the, the routing decision purpose. But as, as I mentioned earlier, when you have a very large internal network, you may also use BGP for that purpose as well. Uh, so IBGP is used to carry some of the internal prefixes, or you can, it can carry all of the internal prefixes, depending on the specific service provider policy. Again, in some cases, those prefixes may not even be in the IGP, in the core IGP, because of scaling issue, or, uh, particularly if you have a very large network. <clears throat> but it, it also carries the ISP's customer prefixes. Typically, if, if, if an ISP has customers, you, it's not advisable to install those prefixes into the internal uh, routing protocol, into the IGP. It is highly advised to inject them into BGP. So BGP is used to carry the customer prefixes within the autonomous system and also eventually advertise um, an aggregated version of those prefixes. But the types of routes carried internally and exchanged externally are different and, and we'll see that also later on. So EBGP is used to exchange routes between different autonomous systems and most of the routing policy is applied there in terms of filtering routes, received and sent, and also um, influencing the, the routing decision, the, uh, manipulating the BGP attributes to influence the routing decision or the route selection. So here is you know, uh, a model of, uh, a model representation of the BGP. So you can see here we have four different networks or autonomous systems and within the autonomous system, there is always IGP, and you will have IBGP peering between routers. Um, between autonomous systems, it's always EBGP. Okay, so, <clears throat> so EBGP is used between routers between different autonomous systems. And those routers who speak EBGP to other autonomous systems are typically called border routers. Um, it typically, the border routers should be directly connected to other border routers, either through a LAN switch or a point-to-point -point connection. There are cases where um, LAN switch is used or uh, layers to switch is used, um, usually in a public peering case, or in other cases, almost always a point-to-point -point link. It could be Ethernet, which is typically the case nowadays, but it's usually a point-to-point -point link if it is a bilateral relationship, peering relationship. <clears throat> You don't want to run IGP between two different autonomous systems. Okay. As a result, the requirement is the two routers speaking EBGP have to be directly connected. Obviously, there are exceptions to the rule, and you can have different connectivity mechanisms to interconnect two border routers. For example, in uh, over a layer 3 VPN network and so on. But 
Typically, that's the exception, um, and it's not recommended. Um, the typical connection is over a direct point-to-point -point or a switched network. So the internal or internal uh, TCP peering, <coughs> um, and here also the term peer is used in two different, to, to mean two different things. One is used to mean a BGP relationship between two equal, um, roughly equal autonomous systems to exchange their own routes. But in other cases, it means any type of BGP peering or BGP session. So, uh, so that may be a little bit confusing, but I want you to be aware of that. So a peer might mean two service providers peering to, to uh, forming IBGP, or oh, sorry, eBGP session to exchange routes without exchanging money. So that's one meaning of peer. Another meaning of peer is just IBGP or eBGP session, okay? So you may see both terms in different scenarios. So <clears throat> for IBGP, there is no need to have a direct uh, connectivity between two routers. The connection between the routers is taken care of by IGP. So there is no need to have a direct connection and it's not possible to have a direct connection because as you will see later on, all routers within a single autonomous system have to, have, have to be fully meshed or fully connected with all other routers within the same autonomous system. Uh, and there are ways to avoid that, we'll discuss that later on, but since that's a fundamental requirement, obviously it's not possible to have um, direct connectivity between IBGP speaking routers. Some of them may be, but in most cases not. Okay. So it's not a requirement to have direct connectivity, uh, direct uh, connection between IBGP speaking routers, but it is important to have that direct connection between uh, IBGP speaking routers. Any questions? Okay. Again, here is uh, an example of a three um, router. Actually, there are four routers. In this case, we have four, uh, three IBGP stations. So the third router, C, is not in the IBGP mesh. So when you have that scenario, that router will, will not be, will, cannot become a transit router for traffic going from another autonomous system crossing this autonomous system to another autonomous system. For it to be transit, it has to participate in IBGP peering, full peering, okay? But as long as you take care of that requirement that that router does not become a transit, you can still avoid having IBGP session for some routers. And some service providers do that. Actually, most service providers do that for the like edge routers, they do not participate in IBGP peering because they do not become a transit router. So depending on the hierarchy of the routing, it's possible not to have IBGP session within a, uh, for all routers within a single autonomous system as long as those routers do not become transit routers. very important uh, for IBGP peering is it's very important to peer using loopback addresses instead of physical interface IP ad uh, addresses. Because a physical IP address will, will disappear if the corresponding port or link goes down. On the other hand, the loopback IP, uh, IP address never goes down as long as the router is up. So it's important to, to configure a loopback address and use the loopback address for IBGP peering. Okay, any questions so far on basics? Okay. So the next session is BGP attributes. 
there are different attributes. When you say BGP attributes, it means attributes of a route. There are different attributes that are advertised along with a BGP route. <clears throat> Not all of them are required. Some of them are mandatory and uh, well known. Some of them are well known but optional. Some of them are um, transitive and do not have to be understood by other, uh, by, by all routers and so on. But the attribute is the basic mechanism by which route selection is influenced. So one of the attributes is SPAS. So SPAS is a sequence of S's that you have to traverse to reach that particular route. For example, in this particular case, to uh, reach uh, 180.10.0.0.16, a router in S500 has to go through S300, S200, and S100. So the S pass for that particular route, as it appears in S500, will be 300, 200, and 100. So the last one is the, 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 where the prefix is originated. And the first one is the directly connect, the, the direct um, uh, AS neighbor. <clears throat> it is used to influence route selection. Usually, if it is a longer path, a longer AS, you do not want to use it, or you prefer a shorter path. But there are other also requirements. So we'll discuss that the route selection mechanism later on. But one of the uses for a SPAS is for influencing route selection. Second one is for loop detection. And we'll see that later on. Uh, and the fourth one is for applying policy. For example, I may prefer a route going through a specific S autonomous system, or I may prefer a route that does not go through a specific autonomous system. So you can apply policy to exclude those prefix or two to, to, to uh, the less prefer or more prefer uh, a route that goes through a specific uh, uh, autonomous system. So as a result, they are used also for applying policy. Okay. So earlier we discussed that autonomous system number could be a two octet number, which is running out, or a four octet number, which would, which would be the future. So if you have a router that doesn't understand a two octet, a four octet ASN, the advertising router that understands a four octet ASN will replace the four octet ASN with two, three, four, five, six. So in this case, for example, S80,000, 70,000, and 90,000 are four octet ASNs because they are more than four octet ASNs, since they are four octet ASNs, S300 understands four octet uh, ASN, but S400 or router within S400 doesn't understand a four octet ASN. In which case, the advertising router will, will replace the four octet ASN with a two octet specific ASN number, which is two, three, four, five, six. Okay. So as you can see, for example, for prefix 180, 10, 0, 0, 15, the 70,000 and 80,000 are replaced by 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So you pick 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1 because of that. So the loop detection. So how do we use a spas for loop detection? The, bit, the, the rule is very simple. If you receive an advertisement that contains your own ASN, then drop, because it means it is a loop. So it detects the presence of a loop, so it drops that uh, uh, advertisement. It doesn't install it or it doesn't advertise it. So that's how the loop, preven pre uh, loop pre prevention is done. So this is loop among autonomous systems. So there are other techniques for loops, BGP loops within a single autonomous system. 
but this loop prevention is a loop uh, prevents a loop that can be formed uh, without the loop detection uh, across multiple autonomous systems. Another important and mandatory, uh, uh, well-known and mandatory attribute which I attribute is next hub. So the next hub is the IP address that will be used to forward traffic to for that particular BGP prefix. So if it is an eBGP peering, the peer address is the next hub by default. And we'll see that we change that uh, using a policy um, uh, into something else, but we'll discuss that later on. But typically, if it is, if it is an eBGP peering, we use the peer address as an ex-hub. That's always the case. But when that particular router advertises that route to another IBGP peer, it doesn't change the next hub. The next hub remains the same. So in this case, for example, for a prefix uh, 150.10.0.0.16 received in AS300 by the first router, router B, the next hub is obviously 150.10.1.1. But even router C, which receives that updates from B using IBGP, will have the same next hub. This has implication. The implication is that C has to know how to reach that particular prefix, which is 150.10.1.1, the link between A and B. So B has to advertise in IGP or through some other mechanism that particular prefix into the internal network. But typically that's not advisor and we'll, we'll see uh, how we avoid that later on. But by default, by default, uh, IBGP updates, when, when, a, when a router sends updates to an IBGP peer, it doesn't change the next hub. The next hub remains the IBGP peer that advertises the route. So, so if you inject a route from a, a local prefix into BGP, for example, in this case, um, router B is injecting that local uh, subnet, which is 121.1.0/24, into BGP, then the next hub is going to be the loopback IP address which is used for IBGP peering, okay? So when it injects that route into IGP, it uses the loopback IP address as the next hub. And the reason is because the loopback IP address is used for IBGP peering. That's the recommended, that's not a requirement, but that's the recommended and that's the practice. <coughs> Remember here, sorry. Remember here, so when a router sends updates to, to, to an IBGP peer, if it is a local prefix that's injected, that's injected by the local router, it uses the loopback IP address as an X hub. But if it is a route, if it is, if the route is received from an IBGP peer, by default, it will not change the next hub. The next hub will remain to be the IBGP peer address. So the, the, there are differences between the two. Uh, here's another one that's rarely used. Uh, this is called third party next hub. Um, it's rarely used and usually it's not good from a policy perspective. But by default, if C has EBGP peer with A and if A has EBGP peer with B and if that peering is over a shared network, then when B, when A advertised routes received from C to B, it will, uh, it will keep the next hub IP address of C. It will not use itself as an next hub IP address. That's the only exception used when um, routes advertise it over EBGP. But in general, you don't normally advertise a route received through a shared network 
another router. Usually you don't do that. And if you do, you, ha you still have to use yourself as an XR. From a policy perspective, normally that doesn't happen. <clears throat> but the default behavior is you, you, uh, the uh, third party next hub is fixed. Okay. So, so next hub based practice. So f by default, as I discussed earlier, for external next hubs to be propagated unchanged to be IBGP peers. So if you receive a route from external uh, IBGP peer, the next hub is not changed when it's advertised over IBGP. But you can overwrite that uh, using a configuration. Uh, on a physical route, you will say next hub self. Uh, in, in most other vendors, also it's the same uh, command. Use next hub self when you advertise to IBGP peer, which means that the, uh, the loopback IP address of the border router becomes an X-hub instead of the EBGP peer address. And that by doing that, it avoids injecting the network that's connecting the, that particular border router to the uh, external peer. So by doing that, you are actually stabilizing your IBGP network, your IBGP network, because it doesn't depend on, on, the, on the flapping or um, stability of that particular link. Also, it reduces the load on IBG. Um, so the best practice always, usually the best practice to do next half sub, which means instead of keeping the IBG peering address as an next half when it's advertised to IBGP, you overwrite it with next half sub. So in summary, the next half IP address should be carried or, uh, using IGP. Otherwise, other uh, IBGP speaking routers will not be able to know how to reach the next half. Uh, typically, you don't want to you, you don't want to uh, inject the uh, directly connected interface into IGP. So to avoid that, you have to override the next half using next half self. Uh, by doing that, IGP will make the decision how to reach to the border router. Okay. <clears throat> Any questions on next hub? Next hub is an important attribute, and it's always mandatory. It has to be there always. Uh, a SPAS may not be there, particularly if you are advertising to an IBGP peer for a locally originated route. There is no a SPAS. Uh, you only advertise a SPAS when you are advertising to. Uh, external route, external peer. <clears throat> you add your own AS to the list when you are advertising to external peer. Okay. So the next uh, attribute is origin. Origin is more of a historical attribute uh, in that be before GDP there was a protocol called EGP. Uh, so to differentiate between EGP and BGP, um, uh, obviously if a route is originated by, from an EGP, it will have EGP as or the origin host, but there is no any EGP speaking router, so typically you don't use EGP. But there are two other uh, values, which is the origin could be IGP or um, unknown. It is it's basically depending on how you inject the route into BGP. If you redistribute the route into BGP, it is called unknown. The origin is, is considered to be unknown. It means less preferred. If it is injected using a network statement, then it is called IG, the origin is referred to as IGP, and it is preferred. Because if you inject using uh, a network statement, you are explicitly injecting a specific prefix, and it is typically good for stability. But if you are injecting the, uh, using uh, redistribute, you are, you are probably injecting a lot of routes, which may cause flapping and so on. So it's usually less preferred. Obviously, again, BGP is heavily policy influenced, so you can override this, the origin of the, the uh, particular prefix, 
uh, using a policy. So it's not fixed, uh, you know, set in stone. You can always override most of this using a policy setting, including the next half. You can override it using a policy. So it is a transitive uh, mandatory attribute. Uh, IGP is preferred over EGP, and EGP is preferred over incomplete um, or unknown. So the, sorry, that's why the, the right term is incomplete. Um, obviously, EGP is no more there, so the two values are incomplete or IGP, and IGP is preferred over incomplete. Aggregator, <coughs> so this is, um, it's possible that you can configure a, a router to aggregate a set of prefixes and inject an aggregate for those prefixes. You can inject both the aggregate and the specific routes, or you can just inject only the aggregate. When you do that, uh, you, you, the aggregator, the, the router that aggregated the route, the, those prefixes is also added as an aggregator. This is mostly, it's not used for, route di for routing decisions, but it is helpful for uh, debugging. So it's mostly informational instead of uh, influencing routing decisions. Another very important attribute is local preference. So local preference is used to influence the exit point from an autonomous system. In this particular case, for example, you receive route 150, 10, 0, 0, slash 15 through two different peers into AS400. Either going through AS300 or going through AS200. If you look at from the AS pass perspective, both of them are equal. So you probably, uh, it's basically a toss or there are tie breakers that you use. But if you want to, is to, to make a decision uh, that I would prefer, as long as the peer is alive, I would prefer going through 300, you can use local preference when you receive the route. When you receive the route from 300, you can say, this has a higher local preference than the route, sorry, the route received through uh, AS200. So by doing that, the traffic that will go to 150.10.0.0 will exit through AS300 instead of AS200 as long as that peer is there. When that peer goes down, then it will go through the AS200. So local preference is used to influence exit points. So in this case, as you can see, we are setting a higher local preference going through AS300 over uh, routes received through uh, AS200, which is 500 and 800. So the 800 is preferred. Local preference, a higher local preference is preferred over a lower local preference. So as a result, the route, the traffic will go through AS300. So in summary, it is a non-transitive optional attribute. So it is, it, it only exists within AS. You don't advertise local preference to your EBGP peer. It's only within a single autonomous system. So when the route is received on, on the border router, the border router sets the local preference and it advertises that local preference to all its uh, to IBGP peers, but the peers will not advertise to an IBGP peer. So it is uh, uh, local, it's non-transitive. Um, the default for Cisco is if you don't set a local preference, the local preference becomes 100. Uh, to set a local preference, you have to use a policy statement to say routes, this set of routes will have this local preference. So, it is, so again, it influences exit points. Another one, uh, another attribute is a multi-exit discriminator. Uh, in some call, in some cases called metric, uh, but the formal the formal um, uh, name is multi-exit discriminator. Uh, this actually, even though it says exit discriminator, it actually influences how a traffic is received into your network. So 
for example, in this particular case, let's say, uh, let's say S201 advertises 120.6810 with a multi-exit decrementer of different values for the two different exit points. Uh, by doing that, going to the next one, by doing that, for example, in this case, it is taking um, 2,000 uh, advertisers to C and uh, 1,000 advertisers to D. Unlike a local preference, a lower mate is preferred than a higher mate. In the case of local preference, a higher local preference is preferred over a lower local preference. But mate is considered as a metric, so a lower value is preferred. So in this case, the pass through D is preferred, which means traffic coming, traffic destined for 120.810 into S201 will come through B instead of A by doing, by setting the uh, made value, okay, by, by setting a lower made value through B. Again, obviously A, the uh, upper S, S200 can decide to, to change that policy using local preference. And local preference has a, a, a higher preference or a higher influence, influence than uh, multi-exit discriminator. And we'll see that later on. But obviously, when, when you do this, the two uh, service providers have to have an agreement. They have to say, I'm going to say it, I'm going to use multi-exit discriminator to influence how traffic is re, uh, coming into my network. And they have to agree on that. If they don't agree, then it may not work because the two, may, uh, the two service providers may use uh, inconsistent policy. So it's very important to have uh, uh, an agreement between the two to have a consistent policy. Okay. So you, you see that it's coming through B only. So again, uh, multi-exit discriminator is between autonomous systems, not within autonomous system. Obviously, the multi-exit discriminator is carried with, after it is received by a border router, it will be advertised to all IBGP peers, but it will not be, that value will not be advertised to another service provider. So if, if a, a made value is received from one service provider, that value will not be automatically propagated to another service provider. You have to set a different made value to the other service provider because it's only used to influence how traffic is received into a particular S. And again, the lowest mate is preferred over a higher mate. Okay. Uh, another important aspect for multi discriminator is by default, only mate values received from the same S is compared. If I receive routes from two different S's, the then, then the mates are not compared by default. Obviously, you can override that using a policy and say, compare mate always. If you do that, then it will compare uh, the made values from um, different ASs. Um, again, some confusions here. It's possible to have the standard wasn't clear on the default value for metric, whether it sh we should always advertise a made value or not. So because of that, different um, vendors implemented it differently. So some vendors may uh, uh, decide to, to send made value by default. Some vendors, and they may decide to, uh, the default to be zero or the default to be higher value. And some vendors may decide if a route is received without a made, it's considered to be a very high made or in some case a very low made. So because of that, it's very important to understand what the different uh, uh, vendor made values, uh, made defaults are, or use configurations to override the defaults. But it's very important to be aware that vendors have implemented it, implemented differently uh, in that respect, because the standard wasn't clear on that. Obviously there are configurations and knobs to influence it one way or the other. Um, 
or most, most vendors provide those uh, uh, knobs. So one of them is um, always compare made. Another one is uh, consider uh, missing made as worst, and so on. So there are configurations to override those default behaviors, vendor default behaviors. Another very important attribute is community. So community is uh, used to group different prefixes, UDP prefixes. You would uh, create different communities and then uh, make different UDP prefixes to be a member of different communities. Then instead of dealing with individual prefixes, you will deal with community attributes. So you can say all prefixes that are members of this community, I will do this, I will prefer this, or I will not advertise them, or I will advertise them with a lower preference, or with a higher preference, and so on. So it makes the, uh, the, the dealing with policy much easier than just dealing with prefixes. And we'll see uh, why that's the case. <clears throat> So community is a 32-bit integer. It's usually, uh, uh, it's usually formatted as S number and then specific pre uh, community value. And the S number is usually the S number of the, the, uh, that service provider. So, if, <clears throat> so it could be, if the service provider's ASN is 100, then the communities will be 100 colon something. So the, and the, the meaning of the community is different depending on the value of the community. So here is uh, an example. Let's say you don't have any, you don't use any community. So in this case, what you do is when you receive routes from S100, uh, uh, you say, I'll receive this, and then you, you do explicit permit to receive it. And then on, uh, I, on uh, outgoing advertisement from F to from E to F, you explicitly allow that prefix. Obviously, if this is if, if there are two, it's easy. Uh, let's say, but let's say we add some more uh, uh, prefix now received from S two hundred. Now, when I add that prefix, I will have to add another uh, filter allow that prefix to go to AS400. So now the configuration is not just one place. You have to apply it to multiple places. Okay? So this is just a simple example, but the, 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 the power is it's really powerful in terms of how you influence policy. And you'll see that also through some, some of the examples, real life examples later on. Now, because of this, this is not scalable. As you add more routers, you have to touch several other routers to just to allow a specific prefix from a specific uh, customer or peer, okay? Uh, now, here is, you know, just extending, uh, again, adding more prefix. We added one more prefix, but we don't want to allow that prefix to go out. So we didn't allow it to go out on that peer. So using community, you can simplify this by saying that when you receive that prefix, you say I'll, uh, I'll, uh, attach community 300 colon one. Again, 300 is the S number for that S. Now, on that peer, you just say allow 300 colon one. On the uh, outgoing E to F, you just say allow 300 colon one. And that will allow that prefix. Allow community 300 colon one. Now, when we receive another route here, we just attach, um, we just make it a member of the same community and it will automatically be allowed on the top one because that community is already allowed or using a policy. So when you receive another one, which is standard, uh, that one, but you don't want to allow it to go out, you make it a member of a different community. In this case, 300 colon nine. Since we only allow 300 colon one on the top, it, it's automatically blocked. It's possible that a prefix may belong to multiple communities. 
So, and it's usually the case. A prefix belongs to multiple different communities which have different functionalities. There are well-known communities. Some of the well-known communities are uh, no export, and that's the value for no export. No export, we'll, we'll see what no export means. Uh, no advertise, that's an, uh, no advertise. No export sub page, another one, and then no click. Uh, we'll see some of them, but some of them, since we haven't discussed about confederation, we cannot discuss about uh, confed and we haven't just discussed about peers from, a, from this meaning perspective, so we'll, we'll not do that, but we'll, we'll uh, touch on the no export. No export means don't advertise to another autonomous system. So if, for example, if A sends a route, uh, two different routes, two different routes, a receives two different routes, uh, advertise two different routes. In this particular case, it's advertising an aggregate uh, 105.700.15 and more specific components of that aggregate. There are several of them, but if it wants to advertise them to that S, S200, but it doesn't want to propagate it to the rest of the, the, the internet. To do that, what it does is it advertises the top one without the no export community which is aggregate, but the more specific prefix advertising is no export. So when S200 receives it, it will use it internally within S200, but it will not advertise to any other autonomous system, to any other EBGP peer. So because it has a no export community attribute. So, so that's a predefined uh, uh, value. Another one is no peer. No peer means a peer is, uh, as, as I alluded first uh, earlier, a peer has two different meanings. One is any BGP session, but another one is a BGP session between two different autonomous systems that exchange their own network, but that are not used for transit to another network. And usually it is statement free, which means they don't exchange money. They just exchange routes and send traffic to one another, but they don't use one another as a transit. So that type of relationship is called peer. So no peer means don't advertise this prefix to a peer. That's, that's the meaning of it. So when you do that, you can apply a policy on, uh, on a peer session to block those communities or those prefixes with the no, exp the no peer community attributes. Okay. Now, earlier we said that uh, commits are usually numbered using a colon uh, notation, S number, followed by a specific community value. Now, but this assumes, again, commits uh, typically are 32 bit. So if it's 32 bit, community, how can you use it in a four octet ASN, with four octet ASN? If you have a four octet ASN, what type of, what should be the first one, the first octet, the first octets for the community uh, attributes? So there are different solutions. One of them is just use a private ASN number instead of uh, a two octet, uh, four octet ASN number or a two octet ASN number. Another one is use the S trans um, S number, which is 23456, to represent a, two, a four octet ASN. But both of these have problems. The first one, it's not, uh, it may conflict with other service provider ASNs because they may use the same private ASN number. Second one is it may conflict with other service providers because it may, they, they may be a four octet ASN and you are using the same first part. So the reason the first part is specified as ASN is to make it unique, unique between service providers or bet to, between autonomous systems. <clears throat> so the third option is instead of using the standard community attributes, use extended community attributes which has 
more fields, uh, longer fields. So the fork uh, chain is uh, used at the extent community attribute instead of a specific community attribute that's assigned for octet for the, for the four octet A chain, and that's specified in that RFC um, five six six eight. So going forward, that will be the normal use. So instead of using a normal community, it will be extended community. Again, communities are optional uh, attributes. Um, and some implementations always advertise communities to their IBTP peers. Some of them do not advertise unless you explicitly say advertise communities on uh, through configuration to IBGP peer. The same thing with EBGP. Some of them by default advertise communities uh, over EBGP peers. Some of them do not by default, so you have to explicitly configure it. Uh, in the case of Cisco, on IBGP, it's the default behavior to advertise communities. But on EBGP peers, you have to explicitly say advertise communities. Otherwise, the community will not be advertised. Um, so it's, it's very important to understand those um, uh, specifics about vendors because the standard doesn't explicitly say always advertise, the default is advertise uh, on IBGP peer or on EBGP peer. So it's up to the vendors to, to interpret it. So there are different interpretations or different choices, not, not so much in terms of inter interpretation. <clears throat> so it's very important to understand those default behaviors. Okay, so BGP pass selection. Um, I'll go through the, the path selection process. So the first is, if the route doesn't have next hub or the next hub route is not reachable, then it will not be considered. If you receive a BGP route and you check the next hub and you don't, you don't have the uh, next hub in your routing table, then you don't install it, you don't advertise it. Uh, also, if the made value is maximum, which is 232 minus one, then it's considered um, uh, not usable, so you don't use it. <clears throat> then comes the preference. In, in the case of Cisco, there is a, a local router specific <coughs> attribute, so it's not really um, a BGP attribute, it is that's advertised to another peer, it's just local to that router. Uh, there is a weight that has a higher preference than any other preference, so the weight. So if, if a weight is configured, uh, for, um, uh, for, for a specific prefix, that way it will have a higher preference than any other preferences. So the next one is local preference. So local preference is very influential. So uh, if you remember, local preference determines how traffic exits an autonomous system. So that, uh, again, a, a higher local preference is preferred. The next one is preferred locally originated routes over routes received from other peers. So if you originate a route, if a router originates a route, then that's preferred over route received from other peers or other sessions. The next one is the length of the AS path. If the AS path length is, is shorter, then that's preferred over a longer AS path. Obviously, you can ignore it. So in most of these cases, there are of, uh, policies to configure to influence the decision. So you can say, ignore as pass comparison, um, I, I, I'm going to use something else to compare routes. Next one is origin, we discussed origin earlier, IGP is preferred over incomplete, then EGP is not there in picture anymore. Uh, mid is, uh, lower mid is preferred over a higher mid. Obviously, there are some knobs. Uh, MED is only compared for routes received from the same autonomous system. If you want to compare it for routes received from different autonomous systems, then you have to use, you have to override it using BGP always compare MED. 
Then the next one is prefer HTTP pass over IBHP pass. So if, if the router receives the same route, one from IBHP peer, another one from HTTP peer, then the route from the HTTP peer is preferred over the route from IBHP peer. Uh, obviously, considering all the others are the same, or all the previous comparisons are the same. The next one is the uh, pass with the lowest IGP metric to the next hub of the BGP route is preferred. And the next one is, if that's the same, then the lowest router ID is preferred of the originator. Uh, and then uh, if, if, if there are multiple router reflectors in the list, then the cluster list, the shortest, shortest cluster list is preferred. And then lowest IP address number for the neighbor is preferred. So in a multi-vendor environment, make sure the pass process is understood each brand. So there are some variations between brands and then defaults also, as we discussed earlier. So some may, for example, advertise uh, made, some may not, and so on. So you have to understand that and avoid the made confusion. <clears throat> Applying policy with BGP. <clears throat> so any questions on the BGP attributes and pass selection. Okay, so now let's see how a policy is used to influence how traffic is uh, routed or which is called typical traffic engineering. You can steer your traffic to go to this way or that way or to come through this way or the other way. <clears throat> so almost nobody just does a default configuration and get done. That's almost uh, not the case, particularly on EBGP peers. There's a lot of policy implemented to filter routes to influence uh, pass selection. So you want to control who you peer with, which means with, your, with, with the service providers that you are peering with, you only advertise your own routes. You don't advertise somebody else's routes. You also select who to transit to, to receive transit from or to become transit to somebody else. So you also want to uh, influence uh, traffic flow to avoid congestion. If one of your links is congested, you want to move traffic away from that congested link and use some BGP techniques to move traffic from that congested link. And remember, BGP is asymmetric. The way traffic enters your network and the way traffic leaves your network are different. So you have to apply different policies to influence those inbound traffic as well as outbound traffic. Uh, policies are applied by setting attributes, the attribute values, by filtering prefixes. You only allow prefixes to be sent or received to certain peers or uh, uh, customers or transits by prepending ASA numbers to, to increase the length of the, AS, the uh, AS pass, you can prepend multiple uh, ASNs to just artificially increase AS pass lengths. By doing that, you can say, don't send me traffic through this unless this peer is done, by prepending a lot of uh, ASNs on one peer. So most implementations have peers. But most of them have a way to um, define prefix lists or prefix sets, to define commute sets, to and then some kind of policy language to to do if then conditions, uh, condition and based on some conditions to drop uh, certain routes or increase, add some attributes or change some attributes and so on. BGP capabilities, this is <clears throat> also very important. Um, when BGP peer, when BGP session is established, the first thing is, one of the first things to do is exchange the capabilities of the two routers. If you remember earlier, we said that if when two routers peer, if one of them does not understand 4 rocket ASN and another one understands 4 rocket ASN, then the one that understands 4 rocket ASN has to replace the 4 rocket ASN with 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, when it sends that update to the uh, two-octet ASN. And the way it knows that that router 
doesn't support for rate fluorescent is not through configuration, but through the capabilities exchange. So when the session is brought up, the cap is I understand what types of capabilities are uh, uh, each side is capable of doing and not doing. Um, so the capabilities are documented in Data RFC, um, and the parameters are up, uh, sent through the DGP open uh, message. And there are some values, 0 to 63 is assigned by uh, uh, INA, and uh, 64 to 17 on a first come basis, and then 128 to 265 is uh, for private use, vendor specific use. So some of the current capabilities are um, multi protocol extension for BGP. Usually this is for supporting like uh, IPv6, supporting uh, VPN V4, VPN V6, and so on. Multicast and so on. Another one is route refresh capability that we'll discuss later on. Um, outbound route filtering capability, um, multiple routes to a destination capability, and so on. Uh, multi pass capability, and so on. So we'll, we'll discuss um, some of these capabilities uh, in the next section but there are some several types of capabilities that are exchanged. So the multi-protocol extension, um, again, this is, as I discussed, this is for supporting exchange of, even though BGP was initially designed for exchanging IPv4 unicast routes, it's now used to exchange different types of routes and information, including VPN v4 routes, uh, VPN v6, uh, layer to VPN, VPWS, uh, multicast, um, MDT trees, and so on. So there are several other uh, types of capabilities that PHP supports. So that's the multi-protocol extension. Route refresh, and we'll, we'll discuss that shortly. Uh, Certain bit support, we already discussed that. And there are some other uh, capabilities in development. So scaling techniques. <clears throat> Uh, I'm going to go a little bit faster. We are running a little bit short on time. So scaling, uh, BGP scaling techniques, we'll discuss about dynamic reconfiguration, route reflectors, and BGP confederation. So <coughs> um, when BGP was first designed, it was very small. So BGP has grown so much. So scaling is very important and the community works um, um, a lot to make sure that the internet is stable and scalable, and there are different techniques and standards that were implemented. Uh, so we'll discuss some of the, one of them is the route refresh. The other, another one is configuration templates. These are vendor specific, but most vendors provide some kind of templates to, uh, to reduce the configuration overhead and improve the scalability. Uh, update groups, uh, that's also pretty much combined with configuration templates. It's typically, in some case, automatic, in some case, configuration driven. Um, route reflectors and configurations, as we'll discuss, route aggregation, which is very important, and we'll discuss it also. For Octet ASN, because we are running out of the Octet ASN. Um, and then, Route flap dampening, but we are not going to discuss that, and it's not that much in use nowadays. Route refresh. Um, when one of the problems with BGP, uh, one of the problems is, let's say you apply a policy to your BGP peer. Now you drop some of some of the routes because of that BGP policy, and later on you change the policy. But since you already dropped, and since BGP is incremental, you will not be able to receive those routes that you have dropped from your peer unless you reset the session. And resetting the session is very bad. So what, what are the alternatives? One of them is the hard reset is very bad alternative because it's, it, it's, not, it's not good for the uh, internet um, stability and it's not good for your network in general. Another one is soft BGP peer reset without the route refresh capability. In this case, to, to be able to reset, to do soft reset, whenever you receive routes from your peer, you will always keep those routes even if they are dropped. So which means 
you have to but you have to have another set of memories that keeps all the routes received from a peer but that takes up a lot of uh, uh, memory uh, particularly if you are peering to so many peers and receiving routes several routes from each one of them so it doesn't scale well so what the route refresh capability does is by implementing the route refresh capability and the two routers if the two routers are capable of doing the route refresh then what happens is when you change a policy the system will automatically send a route refresh request to the peer and the peer will send all the routes that it has uh, and advertise all the routes to that peer now it will apply a new the, the new policy and then uh, uh, proceed with that <clears throat> so that's the route refresh capability uh, so it makes it non-disruptive policy change because without it either you have to have the soft reset with a lot of memory requirements or the hard reset which is very disruptive so for most implementations you don't need to do to do any configuration as long as the two routers are capable of exchanging route uh, capable of doing route refresh they will exchange the route refresh and no additional memory uh, needed um, but the peering routers have to support route refresh and you have to make sure that, that they do otherwise you have to implement the uh, uh, soft reset capability that requires memory in some implementations by doing that you can say if the route refresh is there use the route refresh otherwise use the soft reset that requires a lot of memory the <clears throat> Uh, it's basically a summary of what we discussed so I'll go with the next scale, scaling technique so the next scaling technique is route reflectors earlier we said that all routers within a, a, an autonomous system have to have a full IBGP mesh particularly if some of those routers are going to be used for a transit if it is not going to be used for a transit then you can exclude it from participating in BGP but if it participates in BGP it has to exchange it has to have full IBGP peer but that doesn't scale as you can see here if you have a thousand BGP uh, uh, thousand routers then the scale will be almost half a million IBGP peers on the network and that's a lot of peers so to avoid that we can use route reflectors and the way <coughs> uh, So the way the route reflectors work is when you implement you, you select a couple of routers uh, as route reflectors and then everybody peers with those route reflectors now the route reflectors change in behavior typically when an IBGP peer receives a route from a, one IBGP peer it doesn't advertise to any other IBGP peer it only advertises the route to IBGP peers but with a route reflector when a route reflector receives routes from an IBGP peer it will advertise to other IBGP peers as well as to other non IBGP peers sorry to to other uh, clients as well as to non client IBGP peers obviously it will also advertise to IBGP peers if it receives routes from a non client um, peer IBGP peer it will advertise to clients only it will not advertise to non other non clients so that's how a route reflector is different from normal IBGP router. You can have multiple route reflectors. Obviously, you need to have multiple route reflectors for redundancy. Um, you can also split the network into multiple um, domains, and each one of them will have their own route reflectors, and then the route reflectors can peer with one another using IBGP again. Route reflector uses uh, originator ID for loop prevention. So if a route reflector sees its own ID within, the, uh, within an IBGP ID update, it knows that it, it was originated by itself, so it will drop it. So that's how the loop avoidance works. Again, redundancy is important. Usually, you will divide your network into clusters. Uh, each route reflector will be its own cluster typically and you use the router ID as a cluster ID so normally uh, 
clans will connect with two different route reflectors for redundancy purpose, and those two route reflectors will be in two different clusters. So here is an example. In this case, Indigo shows two uh, clusters. Since they have two different, different domains, you can think of them as six clusters in this case. Uh, but you can also make it just two clusters. Uh, but in this particular case, since we, we normally use the router ID as a cluster ID, there are, in this case, in this particular case, you have six clusters because you have six route reflectors. But the important is each plant peers, uh, has ID fixation to two route reflectors in two different clusters. So the benefit is it solves the IBTP mesh scaling issue. It doesn't impact packet forwarding. It does impact it a little bit, but not much. Uh, a route so a route reflector, one of the decision criteria for uh, BGP pass is if everything is equal, then the IGP metric for the next hub is used. So the IGP metric view of a route reflector may be different from an IGP metric view of the client. So because of that, there is some variation, but it's not significant. So it's worth having the route reflector to, to avoid the scaling issue. And it's easy for migration. So typically, it's always because of that, because the route reflector view of the uh, IGP metric you want it to be constant with the view of the clans. It's important to have the route reflector topologically at the, in the path to all the other routers. It's not always possible, but it's better to try to have it in a topological center to avoid that IGP metric view discrepancy. So, the typical migration, so this is dealing with migration. The typical migration is uh, core routers have fully mesh BGP. So the core routers will have full mesh BGP or the core, if, if you use the core routers as route reflectors, they will, they, will be, they will have full IBGP mesh. And then the edges will have IB, IBGP clamped peering to the core routers. That's one example. So, so but let's say here the core routers have full mesh and we started from there and basically you identify two route reflectors. Let's say if you, have, if you have a small network, you identify two routers as route reflectors and you start establishing IBGP peering with those route reflectors. Once that peering is established, you can remove the full mesh uh, peering later on. So it is gradual, it's easy to migrate. The next one is BGP configuration, confederation. In the same way as route reflector, BGP configuration, confederation deals with the IBGP mesh issue, but it deals it in a different way. What it does is it subdivides the network into smaller networks, and each one of them are considered as a sub-confederation or a sub-S of the big S. So, <clears throat> So it divides the S into sub S's. Each sub S will have IBGP peering within the sub S, and there will be EBGP peering between sub S's. But that EBGP peering between sub S's is not visible externally. It's only internal to that network. Again, in the same way as route reflectors, the whole of the uh, sub -confedera the confederation has one IGP. Uh, uh, network. Mm. So it's probably better to go through the example. Here's an example. So in this case, AS200 is split into s three sub confederations or sub ASs uh, 65530, 65532, and 65531. So, so typically, the private ASN number is used as the confe confederation AS number or the sub confederation AS number. So in this particular case, Confederation 65532 
is configured to kill with other subconfigurations 65530 and 65531, and it's configured with the, uh, the, the S number of the whole network, which is the BGP configuration identifier is the ASN number of the network. So when, when there is eBGP peering between C and external network, it will use 200 as the ASN number for that network. So one of the key in uh, uh, subconfederation uh, is the next hub is not changed when it's advertised from one sub-S to another sub-S. Unlike other eBGP peering, a normal eBGP peering, when you send it from one S to another, the, the next hub is changing. In subconfig, the next hub is not changed. Um, the local preference as well as made are not changed either. But there will be a sub, the, uh, a configuration AS path, sub, the uh, AS path as you can see here, 65002 and so on. But when it is advertised to external routers, that will be removed. That's only for internal within the confederation. So route propagation machine is pretty much the same, except that we remove the, uh, the, the local preference made and next hub as kept as they are. So <clears throat> in summary, to compare the two, both of them deal with the scaling issue, the full mesh scaling issue, and they are hierarchical. They are, there's policy control for both of them, but in terms of scalability, route reflector scales very high compared to uh, confederation. It's easier to migrate. So in, in most cases, uh, route reflectors are preferred and most of the implementations use route reflectors in, instead of confederations. But confederations allow absorbing other service providers into the network. So because of mergers and acquisitions, some service providers went to, through the uh, confederation path instead of route reflector. And you can still use route reflectors within a confederation. Any questions? Okay. So I'll, I'll start this topic and then um, we'll uh, break soon. The next section is not um, as broad as, um, uh, is not long, so I'll include some of the first, this session to the next session. So BGP community is another uh, scaling techniques and we have seen that uh, so I'll jump straight into some of the examples. So here is one example. Um, so there, here are two examples, customer edge and internet edge. Let's go through the customer edge example. In this particular case, let's say um, a service provider has three different types of connections to the internet. Uh, peers, which means exchange free, uh, exchange um, free, um, settlement free uh, peer or IBGP, uh, BGP session, EBGP session. Another one is private peering. Again, that's also settlement free. Another one is transit provider. So they, they, have, they have transit provider. So for their customers, they can provide access either to the whole internet or just to some of the, uh, their own peers. Obviously, when they provide access to the whole internet, since they are paying the transit provider, they will be incurring costs. But if they are sending it only to the peers, then their cost is minimal compared to sending it to the transit, pro to the, uh, transit provider. So they may charge their customers accordingly and then classify their customers accordingly based on that um, uh, relationship. So in this case, for example, so for uh, IXP connections, that's for peering connections, uh, it uses community 100, uh, 2100. Uh, for private peer, it uses uh, 2200. And for internet peering, it doesn't use um, any community. 
so it gives the whole internet. So customers who buy just IXP, they will get 2100. So they, they will only get routes from 2100 with, com with community attributes of 2100. Uh, and customers who buy um, uh, customers who buy private peering as well, they will receive the 2200 community. But customers who buy the whole internet, they will not get community, which means that they will send to the whole internet. So that's how these three different types of customers are implemented. So using community simplifies that configuration. Otherwise, you have to classify each prefix of the customer. And doing that will, be, will not be scalable. Another example is the customer age. Sorry, the internet age. So in the internet age, so this, the first one is the peering applied on the, cust on the customer age. In this case, the community is applied on the internet age. So in this case, the customers are classified into uh, um, classified into customer. So the peerings are classified into customer, IXP, private peer, and transit provider. And by doing that, they 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 uh, basically filter prefixes going to the peer based on these attributes, community attributes. So here's an example. So <clears throat> customer prefix. So if customer wants to send other customers, they will receive 3,000, community 3,000. If they want to send to, um, uh, uh, to receive uh, traffic from IXP prefixes, then they will, they will, rec they will receive 3,100 and so on. Again, the use of both of these cases is instead of using explicit prefixes or applying policy based on explicit prefixes, you group them into communities and you apply the policy based on communities. So that way, you only make the changes on whatever you are adding. If you are adding a new customer, you only make changes to that particular customer configuration. You don't go and make changes to other uh, uh, points in your network. Any questions? Okay. So in the next section, I'll go through some of the uh, communities. I'll just review a little bit of this. Some of the communities that are used by uh, service providers to influence different uh, routing decisions. So I'll, I'll cover that in the next section. Any questions? So the next session will be uh, in half an hour. <clears throat>